Uh, welcome, friends, and welcome to everyone at home. And especially welcome to our guests, Masood Olufani and Rain Wilson. So excited to have you here. Um, you. We know it's, uh, it was quite last minute for the both of you, so your generosity and, uh, and flexibility were greatly appreciated. My name is Frank Robinson, Jr. I serve as the operations manager here at Green Acre, a Baha'i Center of Learning. And normally, in a normal summer, <laughs> we'd be on campus with you all. Uh, <laughs> this is not a normal summer, of course. Uh, Green Acre, for those who don't know, is located on the banks of the Piscataqua River in Elliott, Maine, the ancestral home of the Wabanaki. Mm. But of course, due to the current pandemic, we'll welcome you all to this virtual space. And kind of a silver lining to all this is we, we've been able to welcome more people than normal. Than, yeah. than could fill our hall. So if there's a silver lining in all this is that we have more of you to be with us this evening. Um, part of Green Acre's mission is to elevate discourse around themes of justice, nobility, and the human worth of every human being, constructive resilience and the oneness of humanity. And we've been exploring these themes for literally over a hundred years. Mm. And we're committed to uh, both doing so and learning how to do so in ways that we're constantly improving and evolving. Um, today's webinar will last about an hour and a half. Uh, we'll have presentation followed by a brief Q&A. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and comments in the, in the chat box. However, if you have questions that you think of as we go for our speakers, please put them in the Q&A box. Now, um, I like to think of the chat box as almost like the uh, the live uh, stream of, of, the, of the talk, you know? Oh, that was a great comment, Masood. Frank, your tie is awesome. Um, <laughs> that would go in the chat. But the Q&A box, if you uh, hover down, you should see uh, the two uh, bubbles there with Q&A. That is where you wanna put your question. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jessica Gaines, our program coordinator, who will introduce our guests. And thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Frank. So we are, Super honored to have Masood and Rain here with us. Uh, Masood Olafani is an Atlanta-based actor, mixed media artist, and writer. A graduate of Morehouse College and the Savannah College of Art and Design, Masood has exhibited his work in group and solo shows nationally and internationally. He's the creative director of Blocked, a global healing project, which is a multimedia performance created to memorialize spaces marked by the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade. As an actor, he had a recurring role in the BET series, The Quad, and has appeared in numerous television shows, including Greenleaf, Being Mary Jane, Divas Maze, Satisfaction in Nashville. He's a featured actor in the film, he is the featured actor, or a featured actor in the film biopic, All Eyes on Me, and is the co-host of the PBS news-based investigative journalism show, Retro Report. Welcome, Masood. Thank you for being here. And Rain Wilson is best known for playing the role of Dwight Schrute on NBC's The Office. Additional film and television credits include Galaxy Quest, Almost Famous, The Rocker, Superstar, Six Feet Under, Juno, okay, this is going on a long time. Uh, is it Tom Payne or Thom Payne? It is. Okay. <laughs> The Meg, Mom, and Don't Tell a Soul. He will also be appearing in the forthcoming series Utopia and The Power. Wilson co-founded Soul Pancake, a digital media company, and the Lied Foundation, an educational initiative in rural Haiti that empowers at-risk girls and women through the arts. Thank you both very much for being here. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to y'all. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank Frank, wherever you went, your tie was fantastic. <laughs> it was <Truly>. remarkable. <laughs> Wasn't it something? It was pretty special. <laughs> it, was, it was the first thing I saw. I was like, I have to get that tie. Memorable. <laughs> Definitely memorable. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, folks, all 70 of you out there, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I had talked to Jessica and the staff at Greenacre many months ago about doing a presentation about the Baha'i faith, maybe an introduction about the Baha'i faith or an aspect of Baha'i faith, um, of which I'm a member. Uh, I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. 
And I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to kick things off and then I'm going to push it over to Masood to kind of give you the, the glorious resonant tidbits of, 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 of our scintillating aspects of our conversation. But I'm just going to get things started a little bit. And then obviously uh, a number of things have gone down in the last couple of months. We have a global pandemic, uh, the COVID virus, and we have a global pandemic of racism and racial injustice that has reared its uh, ugly head and really transformed conversations, not just in the United States, but around the globe. So we really wanted to shift our conversation to be uh, relevant to what is happening um, today, what's in the streets. We wanna have an elevated, deep probing conversations uh, that are related to uh, what's happening in the world. Um, Baha'u'llah was the founder of the Baha'i faith. I'm gonna go into that in a little bit, but Baha'u'llah said, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in and center your deliberations on its require, exigencies and requirements. What, so this is one of the key tenets to the Baha'i faith that Baha'is seek to make themselves better people. I don't know about Masood. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, frankly, I don't think he's doing a very good job. Uh, he's got some improvement, but uh, no. Lots. We, <laughs> we seek to become, to increase our spiritual virtues, our kindness, humility, compassion, honesty, all of the spiritual virtues you can think of. But going back to this quote of Baha'u'llah's, we also seek to make the world a better place. And all, all Baha'is are striving to find spiritual solutions to the world's problems. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age you live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. Be really concerned with what's going on and how can we as Baha'is or not Baha'is or spiritual beings or atheists or whomever we are, what can we do to make the world a better place? I wanted to just say a couple things about the Baha'i faith and then a couple things about what I've learned um, recently in the last couple of months and kind of where my journey has taken me. And then I really want to kick it to Masood and see what he has to say. Because it's, um, and, and just, and by the way, I've just gotten to know Masood over the last month or so. And I'm just so excited to be, to be sharing this Zoom room with you, Masood. Um, and uh, really excited to hear what, you, what you've got to say uh, oh, later on. I've, I've learned a lot from you uh, oh, <laughs> in, the last, in the last several weeks. Um, so for those of you who don't know, there's probably of the 80 participants here, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 of you, 20 or 30 of you, I'm going to guess, know almost nothing or next to nothing about the Baha'i faith. So I want to just give you a little primer. Um, First of all, there's no clergy in the Baha'i faith. So myself and Masood, we happen to be two uh, incredibly talented actors. Um, what did I say about working on humility? Um, we, uh, no, we happen to be uh, two actors, among other things, Masood does a lot more than acting. And, um, but we're just stating what our experiences, what our opinions are our way of looking at the teachings of Baha'u'llah and the Baha'i faith, we don't, we're not speaking in any official capacity. Um, the Baha'i faith was founded in the mid 1800s in Persia by a man named Baha'u'llah, whose name is a title that means the glory of God. And Baha'u'llah proclaimed himself to be the most recent in a long line of spiritual teachers that have come sent by one God, no matter what you call this God, Allah or Gaia or the great spirit, whatever you call this God, sent by the one creator to educate humanity spiritually. So there has been a long line of these spiritual teachers. And you've heard many of their names before, like going all the way back to like Krishna and Abraham and uh, Moses and the Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad. And now Baha'u'llah. Uh, Baha'u'llah spent most of his life in prison and being tortured for proclaiming himself to be a divine 
spokesperson, someone who is bringing a message of peace and love and unity and com greater compassion. And yes, justice, spiritual justice to the world. And uh, I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. Uh, so it was really beautiful to be raised in this spiritual tradition, learning that all of humanity is one human family sharing the globe and that uh, the elimination of racial prejudice was one of our greatest tasks and one of our greatest and most difficult battles. The equality of women and men was uh, another social teaching of Baha'u'llah's that uh, is incredibly important. The elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty, another important teaching, the harmony of science and religion, and uh, the individual investigation of truth, which is really my favorite of all of the teachings because it is a clarion call that we all must seek the truth for ourselves. And this came in the mid 1800s uh, from a land where you didn't search for the truth for yourself. You were handed the truth from your parents and from the local mullah or clergy member uh, and by cultural tradition. Nowadays in 2020 in America, we might say like, yeah, I'm finding the truth for myself. Yeah, man. Um, but it goes a little deeper than that. It's the truth of why we are here. What is our meaning? What is our purpose? What is our journey? Um, it's also to find the truth of what, what bill of goods am I being sold by contemporary society? And what is the truth of what's really going on? Not in a... This is often brought up in kind of a political context, but not so much in the political context, but in the, in the truth with a capital T context of like, again, why are we here? What is our purpose? And if humanity is noble and we're here to make ourselves better human beings and make the world and transform the world into, into a paradise, into the kingdom of God on earth, well, what does that really mean? And for me, this has come uh, brought this word justice into focus for me. And I just want to speak just real personally. So that's just Baha'i faith in a super nutshell. There's way, way, way more to it than that. There's Baha'u'llah wrote hundreds of books and tablets and prayers and um, his son, uh, his predecessor, the Bab, the gate, who's also a manifestation of God, a prophet of God had written thousands and tens of thousands of tablets. His son, Abdul Baha, his eldest son, wrote thousands of tablets and books. And there's, just, there's so much to it. The history, I urge you to in, uh, investigate more. We're not gonna go into that so much. But I'm gonna transition a little bit to this idea of the individual investigation of truth and finding, um, finding the truth for ourselves. And in how does that apply to me in light of the murder of George Floyd and the other uh, incredibly powerful and grotesque uh, evidences of the racial injustice that are happening, that have been happening in the United States. And for me, you know, I've been learning a lot. I've been learning a lot and it's been very humbling as a white dude. I often feel really awkward in these kind of conversations. I feel uncomfortable. I feel defensive sometimes. Um, and I think for a lot of people like me, this has been a real wake up call. Like I thought of myself as like pretty woke. I wouldn't be like, like I'm Mr. Woke dude, but fairly woke. And I really had no idea, you know, you know the, the depths, the depths of the anguish felt by so many uh, of my brothers and sisters of color and the, just how insidious and cancerous and grotesque the roots of racial injustice and racial prejudice are and have been. So I've really been on a learning journey. Uh, and uh, what else can I say? I've been reading a lot of really interesting, uh, insightful books that have kind of uh, helped me along this journey. And, and I have clung ever more 
tightly to my faith as a Baha'i because I believe that ultimately we need a spiritual solution to a lot of these issues. Yes, we need, I mean, just as an example, obviously the United States, we eliminated slavery. You know, we had uh, Brown versus Board of Education. We eliminated Jim Crow laws, Voting Rights Act, et cetera. That's all legislation absolutely needed to happen. But did it fix racism? Did it fix prejudice? Uh, systemic racism on one hand and prejudice like carried in the heart, mistrust of the other, um, scapegoating of the other. No, it didn't. So um, I've just been learning a lot about how my faith and uh, how, how, how fighting injustice, both from a spiritual standpoint and from a legislative standpoint need to go hand in hand. And I don't have any answers on this, but it, you know, one of the things that you've probably heard about this book, uh, how to be how to be an anti-racist by Kenzie. Um, it's a fascinating book because so many of uh, myself included, and so many of my white brothers and sisters and family members would be like, "Well, I'm not prejudiced. I'm not racist." And then this author's challenge which a lot of people have been speaking about, which I find really interesting is, well, that's not enough anymore. You know, it's not enough. It never was enough, but especially now it's not enough to think of oneself as mm -hmm. I'm not racist. Instead, standing up to be an anti-racist, to, to take an active stand in fighting, combating racism in all of its grotesque, insidious tendrils that run through our culture and our society. And, uh, that's it's an it's an incredible it's a daunting challenge for me just speaking personally um i had the good fortune of being able to speak to masood on a podcast i do a podcast for baha'is called baha'i blogcast he's been doing a podcast he's got several dozen episodes of a of a podcast on race issues and spiritual looking at them through a spiritual lens uh really fascinating stuff too and like uh, Jessica said in his introduction, because um, I do really want to pass the baton to, to Masood and, and get his perspective on this. Um, I'm really impressed by, uh, sorry, I'm just, I'm going to flatter you for a second, Masood, but this intersection that Masood has of being an, a, a fine artist, you know, has a master's degree in, in fine arts, installation art, art, sculpture, you name it, interactive arts, then an actor, and he's stumbled into acting. And then as a very active Baha'i and also as a uh, working for social justice in the field on the ground. And this intersection between these four aspects um, uh, are, are really um, incredibly admirable and, uh, and, and fascinating how he's interwoven all of them. So I'm just gonna be asking him some questions and let Masood take it and I'll, I'll be here to, to help field some questions. I just wanted to kind of get the ball rolling. So thank you for your patience with me. And Masood, two things that I said I would love to hear your take on, uh, maybe, to, maybe to continue the ball rolling, and that is how can one be an anti-racist? And do you resonate with that? And then I really want to talk about your, how you've found a way to integrate these your spiritual life, your social activism life, your artistic life, your acting life, and integrate them all together. So there's, that's my two main questions. I'll toss both those softballs towards you, which I don't know if there's one you want to take, uh, but I'd love to hear your, your perspective. Uh, um, hmm. The first one is interesting. I mean, I, um, I always began with the premise of, um, of, of, of oneness. Um, and because the Baha'i faith essentially is, is predicated on this, this notion of oneness, right? This kind of unity and diversity, which is very different than this idea of unity and kind of sameness, which is, uh, I think, code for unity without challenge or unity without uh, mm. uh, struggle. Mm. Um, so I begin from the place of oneness. And um, what I mean by that is, and it's not theoretical, I mean, really a deep and abiding sense of our interconnectedness, our interdependence as a human species. And, 
at the core of that is this, um, what uh, in the faith, in, in the Baha'i faith is referred to as this uh, primary identity, which is um, spiritual in mm -hmm. essence. Um, and then of course we have, we're defined by secondary identities, which would be my culture of origin, which is African-American, um, African diasporic. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm a, ma I'm a male. Um, I uh, was, had a good fortune of going to college and all these things are secondary identities to my primary identity, which is spiritual. The secondary identities, um, you know, they're limited. I mean, um, I went to a specific uh, school. Somebody else who went to a different school may or may not understand the experience I had at that school. You know, um, I'm an artist, a creative person. That's the kind of space that I um, uh, operate in. That's where I feel most connected in terms of my calling. Um, someone who is an accountant who doesn't have that experience might find that to be a bit foreign. But the thing that, the quality that transcends all of those secondary identities is the soul, the spirit. And it's the reason why, um, you know, I may have been born in uh, Los Angeles, California and grew up in New York City. But because of my primary identity, my spiritual identity, um, I share um, familial ties from a spiritual level with somebody from Appalachia. You know, I may have been born in the United States. I may have never been to, uh, to Togo or to Benin or, uh, or to Lagos or to, you know, to uh, some other far flung place. But in a very real sense from the Baha'i perspective, um, that sense of oneness, that primary identity unites us into one human family. So those secondary identities fade away when I focus on that core reality, which is that spiritual oneness. Mm. So how do I become an anti-racist? I think it begins with acknowledging that oneness uh, and, and not just, again, not just theoretically with the mind, it has to be acknowledged in the soul and the heart. It's a, you know, they used to say that down on the old, um, in the old plantations in the deep south, that the old uh, soothsayers or the wise women used to say, there's a difference between knowing and knowing. So the one operates intellectually, but there's a deeper sense of awareness, a deeper sense of knowing that comes, takes root in the soul, deep in the bones, and it, it operates in a space beyond um, the intellect. So Knowing, understanding that one is knowing that one is deep in the bones, knowing, knowing that. And from that space, consciously working to build sincere connections with people from diverse backgrounds, choosing that consciously. Occasionally taking an assessment of my surroundings, my circle of friends, you know. Are these relationships Am I being challenged in these relationships, culturally speaking? Mm. You know, um, am, I, am I growing? How is this idea of the oneness of mankind being, um, is, it, is it being advanced through these relationships? Or am I following a pattern of exclusion, right? Mm. Um, whether conscious or subconscious, um, that reinforces fragmentation. So um, there's this, so it begins with this, this I, I think anti-racism begins with, begins with this kind of arriving at this understanding, this, this deep interconnectedness of oneness, and then consciously taking steps um, in the realm of action mm. to, um, to extend this idea in the world, to broaden that circle of fellowship. So. And, and that's that's interesting that you say that, and that that sparks to mind the, the one of the principal teachings of Baha'u'llah, which is let deeds, not words, be your adorning. So yeah. again, that that relates to how to be an anti-racist, and and exactly what you're talking about, because um, it's one thing to say, well, I'm not racist, yeah. I'm not prejudiced, yeah. um, but it's another thing to say, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. in a completely racist environment, the systemically racist environment. So I need to take positive action constantly to increase my circle 
and mm -hmm. to fight racism. And by doing so, expanding my circle of my friends and family to include uh, the people of greatly diverse backgrounds other than me, that that's, that's deed, not just a word. It's, so it's, it's more, it's, it's far more active. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we're fortunate. I mean, the Baha'i faith, um, we have the example of Abdul Baha, who you referred to um, earlier as the um, perfect example of what it is to lead a true Baha'i life, right? I mean, he's the one that we look to in terms of uh, how to negotiate life in a spiritually kind of centered way in light of the Baha'i yeah. teaching. Mm -hmm. And he was very, you know, he was very um, deliberate and demonstrable in how he pushed the notion of the oneness mankind forward. Um, you know, one of the, the one of the uh, great people who uh, amongst the many great people that this um, um, faith has kind of given birth to was a man named Lewis Gregory, who was uh, part of the talented 10th in the early 1900s, which was a group of um, uh, kind of um, intellectual uh, giants in the African-American community, along with W.B. Du Bois and many others. Um, and he had trained as an attorney in, in uh, Howard University and um, very dignified man a very intelligent man. And uh, there happened to be a gathering um, in Washington, D.C. At a, uh, at, um, in a wealthy neighborhood. And it was a dinner gathering and Abdu'l-Baha was the guest of honor at this. Uh, he had come to America to share the message of Baha'u'llah, his father, the prophet founder of the faith. And um, uh, Mr. Gregory uh, had come to the house, but he, as everybody was gathering in the dining room to to, to eat and to enjoy fellowship. He was standing in the interior room. And uh, just an example of how demonstrable Abdu'l-Baha was, he, he said, where is Mr. Gregory? And of course, owing to the customs of the time, uh, it being segregation and that being stringently enforced uh, across the, the United States, particularly in the South, um, you know, uh, he was told, Abdu'l-Baha was told that he was in the, in the other room and Abdu'l-Baha said, bring him. And he brought him into the room, into the main dining room and sat him in the seat of honor next to him. Now we're talking the early 1900s, you know. Uh, today that's something that seems relatively, um, you know, benign. But back then it was an extraordinary gesture, particularly for someone uh, of Abdu'l-Baha's um, kind of uh, standing and bearing and, and, and stature, right? For him to say that in this revelation, the oneness of mankind is the core principle of the faith. And not only am I saying it to you, but I'm going to demonstrate it to you so that you will see it is not just a theoretical supposition, but it is a fact. It is a reality um, and it's inescapable. So yeah, so I mean, that, that's an example of, of, of a very powerful example, of course, of. Of, uh, of taking action, but I mean, I think all of us in our own ways can, um, can, can take advantage uh, of opportunities and demonstrate our fidelity to that principle of the oneness of mankind, so. And any ideas, any, any specifics in that, in, that, in that regard? Yeah, man, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it's interesting because the issue of race, the issue of oneness is, um, is the simplest thing and also the most complex thing in the world. It's simple because you accept, yeah, we're, we're, we're all one. I feel that, I, I, I really feel that. But then you have to negotiate those diverse spaces. Hmm. You know? and, and, and how do I enter those spaces? You know, do I enter them with a sense of humility and a desire to want to learn and to grow? Um, do I enter them with, um, a subtle form of arrogance or uh, prejudice, you know, that maybe I haven't grappled with in a meaningful way in my own life, you know? Um, so there's that, 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 that personal assessment. The Baha'i Faith says, bring thyself to account each day ere thou art summoned, are summoned to a reckoning. Mm -hmm. So checking in with self as we go into these spaces, you know, consciously making a point I'm going to enter this space. I know it might be uncomfortable. I know it might be difficult. I'm going to be one of only two, or I'm going to be the only one who looks like me, who understands my cultural context. But I'm going to choose to go into this space, not so much because I like it or I want to, but it's because what God asks of me in this day. 
And this is the call of oneness. It requires the sacrifice of self, the sacrifice of my own maybe personal desires, personal taste, um, to demonstrate my fidelity to this principle and to honor what God has asked me to do. So making that conscious choice, checking in with self, how am I entering this space? And then making the conscious choice, I'm, gonna, I'm going to sit in it. Hmm. Yeah, you had um, written an article recently for Baha'i Teachings about discomfort and how uncomfortable these conversations are and can be, especially for, for, for white people just new to this world. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about how you, you were talking about how the discomfort yeah. leads to greater growth? Yeah. Discomfort is the price we pay to advance the cause of oneness. If we're not willing to be uncomfortable, then we're only giving lip service to this transcendent reality that is at the core of this revelation, right? At the heart of this revelation. So discomfort is the tax I pay for the realization of oneness. Right? So choosing to be in those spaces to, um, to step out of what I know and to consciously, with a fullness of heart, with a fullness of heart, courage, the real, recognizing that I am moving toward discomfort, but the price is worth it mm. for what's coming on the other side. Mm. This, I, I don't know about you, and we've talked about this when we were talking in, in, in your, on your podcast. Any significant growth that I ex have experienced in my life has not come without some measure of discomfort. Mm. Yeah. If I get up in the morning, I go for a jog, right? I'm going to breathe hard. Perhaps my calf muscles will hurt or whatever. There is discomfort, but I also know that I'm strengthening my heart. I'm exercising my muscles, which in turn also lead to you know, health and longevity hopefully going forward, right? Mm -hmm. So if I just take, if I take something as simple as just something as small and insignificant as Masood and just my own, my own body and the health of my own body being in. And then I, 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 I take that telescope and I, I fan out that way from Masood. Now look, this is something that is going to, that is for the entire planet, for every soul on the planet. And if I'm not willing to be a little bit uncomfortable for that, hmm. you know, what am I, what am I willing to, to give? What price am I willing to pay for that? Right. And that's the question we all are asked on a daily basis as we enter the world. That's, that's fantastic. And I, there's so many questions I, I want to, uh, ask you, um, I loved that what you, you had said this in our podcast, sorry everybody, to quote this podcast discussion we had, but it really turned on a light bulb for me. I mean, it seriously turned on a light bulb for me. It was the first thing you led with, which is that we all have two realities. Mm -hmm. um, I have done some other presentations with other folks about race and race issues and racial justice. And some Baha'is had asked, well, in the Baha'i writings, there's stuff that says, hey, we're all the same. And then there's also writings about unity and diversity and how we're all multicolored flowers of different types and that we're variegated and that makes a garden more beautiful. But I yeah. thought that, that that way that you summed it up, which is, um, I don't, I just think it's, it took a, a kind of an obvious, mm -hmm. and it's one of those topics that's both obvious and really complicated. And it boiled it down for me. And, uh, and, and that is this idea that we have these two realities, that we all yeah. are, yeah. we're souls, we're divine souls inhabiting a flesh yeah. suit for like 80 or 90 years, having, having a good time, having a hard time going on our, yeah. you know, born like me into great, you know, privilege as a, as a white dude in America in the 1970s yeah. and 80s. And mm -hmm. Uh, other people, or who knows where you're born? You could be a farmer in Mongolia, or whatever your, wherever your place is, and that, um, 
but we're spiritual beings. And then we also have this other uh, yeah. aspect of ourselves. Um, and so that, that dance, I love yeah. that in the Baha'i writings that we're doing both things at the same time. Like, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, and that's, a ch I guess that would be a challenge for someone like me is to kind of like, Hey, Masood, I see the divine within you. I see the beauty of God and, and God's, mm -hmm. Uh, your eternal soul in you and also to say hey you're an african-american guy you've had mm -hmm. this journey you've had mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. struggles yeah. um what's that like how can i empathize with that how can yeah. i support you how can i be an yeah. ally to you how can yeah. i humbly learn from yeah. what you've gone through and cherish cherish our differences yeah. actively yeah. and I, I love that yeah i love Man. that dance you 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 touched on something that's got me thinking about something, man. I, you know, I I, um, I have a tendency sometimes to think in um, in in um, with a musical kind of state of mind. I'm thinking about uh, jazz music, man, and about and I love jazz. It's like my favorite form of music, right? Mm. Um, but I'm thinking about how you know in a jazz composition you have a central structure, right, where the melody is set, and then right. you have these these uh, great musicians who come in and they improvise off of that core structure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, you might, I don't know, you might listen to uh, something like John Coltrane's Love Supreme. And then you have, you know, uh, Coltrane is playing that incredible, um, you know, Ella Jake horn. And then you have the basis is, you know, he'll, he'll jump off there, man. He'll start doing his thing, but the, the core theme is still there. Right. But he's playing that bass, man. And then you got the pianist. He's doing his thing, man. He's dancing off of that core structure. So in a, in a, in a sense, I, I think for me, it helps to think of humanity that way. We've got that core spiritual structure that is there. And then cultures kind of dance off of that, man. They improvise, they play their themes, man. But that, that core spiritual structure holds us together, what knits us together. And I may not be able to play the way you play, but man, I'm sitting over here digging how you play. And I'm saying, man, I love the way you play. I can't play the way you play, but I'm, I'm loving that, man. And I appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us, if we, you know, we're these finely tuned, uh, if, we're, you know, if we're being conscious, I think, and, and, and we're really thinking about it and feeling this, it's almost like we're these musicians in God's orchestra, you know, and he's conducting that orchestra. And he's called all these incredible musicians in from around the world. And he's saying, in this space, you can dance. I want you to play. This is the core structure. Play. I want to hear you play. You know? That's beautiful. And, you know, it's, it's uh, Dr. King used to say that, um, um, he used to say that uh, on God's keyboard, every key from a bass black to a treble white is precious on God's keyboard. Mm. You know? So, mm. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really cool. And, uh, and by the way, folks, uh, you're 80 or 90 of you here. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We got a little Q and a, uh, box down at the bottom, right? It looks like two little bubbles. Um, we'd love to make this more of a dialogue. So with you guys, we can't see your faces, unfortunately, but, uh, please put in your questions, uh, for myself and, and Masood, um, as we go. So, Going off of that, that, I love that analogy, and that was so well said. And that, this was, I had left the Baha'i faith for a long time when I was younger, mm -hmm. and then come back into it. And as I was pursuing my career as an actor and an artist, mm -hmm. and I was really struck by the number of writings in the Baha'i faith that talk mm -hmm. about the centrality of the arts. Mm -hmm. and how the arts are the same as worship. Mm, yeah. Abdul Baha, who you mentioned, said a quote, um, uh, I rejoice to hear that thou hast taken pains with thine art for in this most wondrous age, art is the same as worship. That is to say, when you pick up the paintbrush, it is as where you were kneeling in the temple. This is what he said. And I just love that quote and so many other quotes that support this idea of and there, there's so much to talk about. We could have our own presentation about that too, but I would love to hear about your perspective as, uh, as an artist, as a, as a Baha'i and an artist, and also because your art 
is is fascinating. And I've seen a lot of your stuff online. I haven't gotten to see it in person. And you could tell us about what this new installation at the Rosa Parks Museum that you've just been doing um, about that intersection between yourself as a spiritual being, Baha'i, yeah. Baha'i identified spiritual being, as an artist, and then as a as a as a as a really a, a fighter for social justice and and how your art yeah. you know, influences this fight for social justice and, and illuminates illuminates it and elevates it in so many cool ways. I'd love to, love to hear your perspective on that that yeah. triangle. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, man. You know, I, I think um, you know, I, I I came to art to creativity quite naturally. It was just um, it was something that just felt right, you know. And I would spend a lot of time as a kid drawing and, uh, you know, and, and acting, you know, uh, performing as a child uh, for my parents mostly, but sometimes in school plays as well. Uh, so I just had an expressive kind of, uh, of way of relating to the world. Um, so that, that has been there since I've been about four years old and I was lucky enough to have a mother who um, recognized that I had a kind of natural inclination towards, um, you know, uh, the artistic experience. and. Uh, encouraged me. And then I got some training and was, you know, and all of that. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it, 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 the way that I approach what it is that I do, whether that's in the field as a visual artist or um, as an actor, as a writer, um, it, it, re it really, for me, it begins with intentionality, you know, with, with what's, mm -hmm. with, with what's at the core, what's at the heart. Um, and I find that as a Baha'i, I mean, I'm obviously the writings are, you know, uh, fortunately for you and I, Rain, we don't have to, uh, you know, uh, put up too much of a fight about the validity of being an artist. Mercifully, Baha'u'llah said that it is a, uh, a, a very, uh, a, a, a wonderful and, um, you know, um, indispensable, um, uh, you know, aspect of, uh, of, mm -hmm. of life. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, I, I, Growing up, I my, I'd gone to church. I mean, I became a Baha'i when I was 22, right? Um, but I'd always had a sense, even before becoming a Baha'i, I had a sense of um, a spiritual reality, if you will, right? Like something was churning inside. And I have found since I became a Baha'i and the teachings of Baha'u'llah and how they have uh, over time framed my life, it informs everything that I do. And my creative practice is an aspect of what I do, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I find that I don't have to be um, really, uh, how should I say, I don't, I don't have to go at it with um, a sense of like this intense deliberation. It's just there. <laughs> you know? and, and the fact that it's there, it informs what it is that comes out of me. Um, so, you know, when I'm thinking about um, what I'm going to, you know, create, um, of course, uh, you know, um, the artist, uh, one of the, uh, I think the, the core um, missions of the artist is to provide context to life, what's going on in the world around you. Hmm. And when inform that with a, when that is based in a kind of um, spiritual reality, right? Um, you're going to be concerned with the world around you um, the beauty, also um, the parts that are ugly, the grotesque and the, um, and the uh, majestic. Mm -hmm. And you're going to try and find a way to, to provide context to that through art. So, um, you know, I, I remember I was, at a, I was at a meeting back in the 90s and uh, there was an artist there. And this artist said that uh, uh, from now on, he was only going to paint religious based art. And there were a number of people in the room who cheered him on for this. And I felt very sad for him for that. And the reason I felt sad, not because there's nef not necessarily anything wrong with um, painting religious art, but if your heart is attuned um, to your soul, right? And it's grounded in spiritual truth and reality, whatever comes out of you, whether it is a specific relation to your faith or whether it is speaking about some aspect or some principle of your faith without being like so obvious is a reflection of God. So yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. for me, that that's that's all that's continues to be the guiding force for me. So when I'm in the studio and I'm wrestling, and you know, the African American artists, uh, the the, the artists from the African diaspora has a very, very kind of uh, important role in society and culture, and particularly to the black community, because so much of our reality and our existence is about survival. How am I going to get from one day to the next? How am I going to survive? How is my family going to endure? So the application of our, our artistic practice is in service to that, mm. you know? So um, there's that sense of mission. And then that's also based and informed um, fundamentally by my faith. So there's that legacy of social action that comes out of the Black Arts Movement, right? We can go all the way back um, many, many uh, generations ago. And then the faith and its, um, you know, uh, the teachings on justice, the teachings on the equality of women and men, the teachings on the oneness of mankind, the harmony of the science and religion, all of these core principles which are constantly reinforced, that informs what it is that I do, whether I'm in the studio, um, deciding whether or not to take a role or what to write about, so. What's this new installation at the Rosa Parks Museum? Yeah, that's, um, um, it's interesting. I, uh, it's an installation that I'm in the process of completing now. It's called um, Down Yonder, I Heard Someone Calling My Name. And uh, it, it's um, the term down yonder, of course, I heard somebody calling my name is literally, it has a number of different meanings. So literally, it's like I heard somebody calling my name, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also this whole tradition of call and response, which is such an intricate part of the Black experience here in America, right, of our musical tradition, the way that we, um, you know, we would uh, send messages, you know, uh, in the call and response music. So, you know, many people know what call and response is, some people don't. If you go to a black church, uh, the reverend says, uh, he says something and he gets the congregation going and, the, and somebody in the congregation will go, amen, hallelujah, yes, sir. So that's calling, he's making a call and the congregation is responding. In song, it could be, you know, um, somebody's, you know, uh, uh, go down Moses, way down the Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. And then the response will be, let my people go. So, yeah. so down yonder, I heard somebody calling my name is that call, that spiritual call that I hear in the heart. And then my response is the work that comes out of responding to that voice, that spiritual um, voice that I hear inside. And it's informed by what's going on in the world around us right now, be that issue of racism, um, uh, social stratification, um, uh, you know, the soul's aspiration for transcendence, all of these things uh, inform the work. So it's, the, the call is something I hear in the heart and then I'm responding to it uh, creatively in the work. So, yeah. That's beautiful. Um, tell me, uh, the name of the talk we had today is Justice, the Best mm -hmm. Beloved of All Things, which is uh, one of my favorite quotes, a super simple and incredibly profound, really unknowable quote, but Baha'u'llah says in his book called The Hidden Words, mm -hmm. which is written from a perspective as like God speaking to humanity. and and Baha'is really take it as the word of God. And it says, the best beloved of all things is my, in my sight is justice. Yeah. Turn not away therefrom, if thou desirest me. So yeah. the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Mm -hmm. Turn not away therefrom, if thou desirest me. If you yeah. desire God, you cannot turn away from justice. Yeah. In light of what's happening, right now um, and still week after week all of these videos of, of violence perpetrated against uh, african-american especially males but uh, people is coming out you just see it still every day new stuff and then old stuff that had been videotaped and um this it's like this this boil has been popped and yeah. you you kind of see the depths of injustice which of course um I've been told, I, I wouldn't ever presume to know this, that African-American people have known for, <laughs> since they were born for decades and just uh, a lot of white people are just waking up to right now. But 
in this, with this current environment and with that quote, especially, if you desire God, you cannot turn away from justice. And social justice means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. To some people, it means voting for the right candidate and campaigning for the right candidate and the right party. Yep. The highs don't even get involved in partisan politics. Um, what, is, what does that mean to you? How, mm. Can you help, help unpack that, this idea of justice through, seen through a spiritual lens, through Baha'u'llah's lens as written in the hidden words? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, the African-American community has a long um, history. <laughs> of uh, seeking justice, you know. Um, obviously, it, it, it began, uh, you know, uh, on the slave ships and uh, continued on to the uh, colonies and the plantations and, uh, and on through the uh, end of uh, slavery and uh, the Jim Crow era and so forth and so on. So there's been this long uh, engagement around the issue of justice. Um, and, you know, and primarily that, that experience or that, that, um, that that um, remedy has been sought in the court system and in the passing of laws, which is a very important aspect of, you know, of, of seeking justice. Um, but, you know, there's another dimension that unfortunately in our materialistic world that we live in now that we sometimes forget, and that's the spiritual dimension. Um, and justice, incidentally, this is a very interesting dimension of it. It's something that I had to come to understand is based on truth. The Baha'i Faith says that truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. So you can't have, you can't practice any other virtue. And we talk about the virtues, we're talking about things like justice, courage, um, compassion, love, so forth and so on. Um, all of those things, their foundation is the truth. And America has this long history of having a really um, peculiar relationship to the truth. <laughs> so much that it well is. said well said <laughs> yeah yeah that's so that's yep spot on so much to, so that it has constructed this mythology right and through the um, mechanism of um you know of, of of a great kind of marketing team <laughs> throughout the ages mm -hmm. uh has managed to convince much of the world that it is the shining city on the hill but of course those of us mm -hmm. Who have a very different relationship um, to the American experiment um, know that there is um, that that is um, there's a there's a deeper reality <laughs> that is not uh, talked about. And so you know we we have practiced this kind of uh, not wanting to look at our the problematic aspects of ourselves. We have scapegoated. We have lied. We have. Um, you know, created false narratives. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, this idea of justice continues to elude America. Mm. Because we haven't, we haven't done the fundamental work, which is to reconcile with the truth, with the reality of things. Wow, wow, that's, that's, that's so cool. Um, really resonating with that. Mm -hmm. You know, legislation being one thing, but this kind of false mythology denial that our country, because um, recently there was this, uh, the Center for Race Amity, which is a Baha'i inspired nonprofit had a thing on e pluribus uni, unum out of many one, which we're talking about unity and diversity being a fundamental teaching of the Baha'i faith. And, and there's this mythology that out of many one we're making the United States, but it's not, it's not true. It hasn't been, it hasn't been true. No. Um, it's no. true that there is a lot of diversity, but that doesn't mean that we're making them one. No. Um, no. But, oh shoot, I forget where I was gonna go with this. Um, uh, oh, this is what I was gonna say. It reminds me of uh, addiction. Mm. Like my family is riddled with addiction from every branch of my family up and down. And I've had to put a lot of cousins through uh, yeah. rehab mm -hmm. and had inter actual interventions, like hired yeah. an interventionist and like had yeah. intervention. And that intervention is so difficult because you're trying to break through this denial, this yeah. essential denial. Like I don't have a problem with 
drugs. I don't have a problem with sex. I don't have a problem with alcohol or whatever it is. I'm fine. I'll get myself out of it. I just was going through a bad spell and it'll get better. And yet there's been, you know, decades of the same action happening over and over again. And Mm -hmm. that's what the job of the intervention is, is before you haul their butts off to rehab is to kind of break through that denial. And that's, that reminds me a little bit about what you're saying right now, like to go for, for true justice, for the truth, getting to the truth. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to break through that. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting because it's, you know, the, the, the manifestations of God are very much like these, um, these very competent physicians, right? Mm-hmm. And humanity, we fall into illnesses, right? Uh, the body of mankind gets sick. We deviate from, uh, you know, from God's laws, from mm-hmm. his order, the divine order, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, we find ourselves, you um, um, becoming diseased as a, uh, you know, as a human species. So God mercifully sends these messengers to us as these kind of like these divine physicians, these very competent physicians. And they prescribe, they, they, they take a look at the body, the body politic of mankind. They say, oh, okay, so this needs to be addressed. Oh, so we got a problem here. This needs to be addressed and this needs to be, well, let me, I'm gonna prescribe a remedy for you. <laughs> so now the patient has a choice to make right and we're seeing some of this you know in evidence today right in particular with something like COVID-19 the, the patient has a choice to make whether or not they're going to heed the advice of the competent physician right mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Take the remedy or deny the advice of the competent physician you know and decline further and further into sickness mm. right so truthfulness, apparently humanity has had a fundamental problem with the truth. Because in this revelation, it's the foundation of all human virtues. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And in America, you know, we're told that racism is America's most challenging, vital and challenging issue. Yeah. Vital as in important, but vital also in terms of the health of the body, of the body politic, vital right? It's necessary for survival. The overcoming of racism is necessary for survival and challenging because it's so complex. It has worked its way to every thread of the fabric of American society. There is not one aspect of American society that you can look at that has not been infected with the cancerous poison of racism, right? So truthfulness being the foundation of all human virtues, there has to be right? A deep and meaningful engagement with the truth. And it's uncomfortable. It's what we talked about earlier, right? It's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's difficult, but it's necessary for the healing of the body. Mm-hmm. It's necessary for the restoration of the soul. Mm-hmm. And if we don't take the medicine, we may soon discover, as Dr. King said so prophetically, that racism is a sickness unto death. Mm. Powerful, powerful. Um, it's so great, man. Thank you so much. I'm getting so much from this. And I, I wanna honor our Q&A, or we've been going for about an hour here, and I've said an hour and a half, so I'm gonna jump to some Q&A, uh, if I may, here. I saw... Um, uh, a comment here from Jana Hannigan. Um, as Baha'is, we know that words are creative, that the holy words are particular, infinitely creative. I'm concerned about the words anti-racist. I find it hard to be attracted to this term. Uh, it, it seems to me it creates an impetus for fault finding in others that is looking for hints of racism and calling it out because of our desire to be anti-racism. Oh yeah, interesting, good point. This concerns me, words are so powerful. Is there more quality word that can be found? Can we be aware of the destructive forces and still align with the constructive forces? Am I allowed? Oh, here's, here, this is nice, Masood. Mm-hmm. And at the, look at this last sentence here. Am I allowed to express this concern? I find my heart racing even as I ask this. Thank you for sharing that, Jana. That's, that's really vulnerable and, um, and yeah. says a lot. Thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on it, but I obviously really want to hear your perspective. But if I, if I could just uh, yeah, launch the discussion, 
so I guess the main concern would be, does, does saying, because calling oneself an anti-fascist then lead you to be, you know, part of cancel culture, essentially. Like, if I'm going to be an anti-racist, it's kind of like I'm online and someone mm -hmm. says something, they're like, you're racist! Like, mm -hmm. um, so Baha'u'llah tells us that conflict and contention are expressly forbidden. Yeah. So how do we as Baha'is be a quote-unquote anti-racist mm -hmm. without conflict and contention? Because that would create conflict right. and contention if you're like yelling at someone, pointing a finger at somebody um, in, a, in a way that's insulting or derogatory or uh, shaming. That's creating conflict and contention. So that's one question I'd love to hear your thought on. And I guess for me, when I hear that question is, um, excuse me, I still like anti-racist because for me, it feels proactive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm anti-poverty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I want to be anti -po I want to be anti-sexist, mm -hmm. anti-poverty. I want to be anti-pollution, right? Yeah. I want to be anti-injustice mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, I'm not saying I am any good at that, but it's something I strive toward. Yeah. So to me, it, it, it opened up my eyes in a way in, because there's a new concept for me. I mean, a lot of people have been talking about it for many decades. For me, forgive me, I'm sorry, it's new to me. Yeah. It has helped me shift my perspective towards, again, like I said at the top, uh, I'm not a racist toward how can I f fight racism where I, where I, where I see it and, yeah. and call it out and without conflict and contention. So your thoughts, Masood? You know, it's a difficult thing. I think, um, first of all, I think, uh, you know, there's a couple of, of, of qualities I think that come to mind when dealing with subjects like this. I mean, the first is courage, right? Um, um, truthfulness again, right? Um, um, I feel, I feel like uh, uh, empathy is in there as well. Hmm. Um, justice is in there. Um, I think you have to be, it seems to me that each situation is different, but if I, if I have to think about a general kind of way, way of being, it's to, the Baha'i Faith has this, this really interesting view of what's going on in the world right, right now. Um, we look around us and there's all this kind of consternation. There's, there's people are very angry. They're upset, justifiably so, because of generations of injustice. Um, and there's a sense that something is being torn down, that the institutions that we historically have put so much faith in, right? Right. Feel us again and again mm -hmm. and again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the general populace is just fed up and they want to see it gone. So there's this destructive this destruction that's going on, right? Yep. And if I, if I focus on that, right? If, I, if my mind is just into the destruction, um, then that eventually spirals into, uh, into chaos, you know, and a kind of um, hopelessness, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. Baha'i Faith says there's this other process that's going on at the same time that the dest this destruction is going on, and that's a constructive process that something is being built in the wake of what's being torn down, right? Right. And there's an intrinsic relationship between those two processes, mm -hmm. right? So when I think about, you know, my engagement, um, whether it be, you know, how I'm engaging in protest, um, how I'm uh, interacting with someone who, um, clearly has, um, is, is either a virulent racist or is not, a, not aware of, uh, is a passive racist or whatever. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about how to negotiate those relationships, keep them steeped in truth and honesty, loving honesty. Love has to be at the foundation of that, right? I have to be wanting, I want to turn on the light for you because I love you. Right? Because even though you are afflicted with the cancer of racism, we still are one human family. So if there's an opportunity to touch something in your heart and to cause a transformation, right? 
I have to be about the business of doing that, you know? And that's a constructive process. The people who, in Atlanta, we had, um, you know, a lot of, there were a lot of protests here in Atlanta. And unfortunately, uh, there was a small segment of the, um, of, of the uh, civil disobedience took place where people were breaking things, you know, and, 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 um, and breaking some of the windows and things downtown. One of the most beautiful things I saw uh, was the day after. People just showed up, man, from different communities with a broom, with a dustpan, with a bottle of Windex and a rag, and we're cleaning up. That was mm. constructive, right? Mm, mm, mm. right? They were healing in the wake of the destruction. Mm. They, were about res they were about restoration in the wake of desolation, you know? Mm, mm, mm. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm going into these spaces, when I'm considering what my action is, whether it's on an on a interpersonal basis or whether it's, you know, more in, um, in engagement, you know, uh, in community, um, I'm constantly thinking about what, what, first of all, what is my intent? Is my behavior in alignment with the tenets of my faith? Mm -hmm. And how through this engagement can I demonstrate my fidelity to the principles of my faith, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been wrestling with this, man. I've been angry. I've been racked with grief. I've been frustrated. Um, but I've also been filled with an abiding sense of hope. And quite to my surprise, joy, an abiding sense of joy. Wow. The joy, the joy comes because I see in what's going on, I see, I, I see this intersection of this destruction of this old way of being and then the birth of this new world that's coming. And my goal as my focus uh, as a Baha'i, um, as a black man, um, as an American, um, as a child of the living God, is to lend my talents, whatever gifts that I have as they are, to a constructive process and not a deconstruct and not a destructive process, you know? That, that's, that's great. And that just going with that, um, I know that uh, part of what you're saying, I hear as it's easier to protest something than it is to build something. Mm -hmm. um, it's both are important, but it's, it's more difficult to kind of construct something and build it. And Baha'is are involved in this work from the ground up, grassroots, yeah. social activism, uh, in the communities. Um, it can be a devotional gathering. It's working with children. It's working with junior youth. It's working with teenagers. It's having study groups. It's doing home visits, uh, service, all based on service and service projects. And I know you've been active a lot in that. Can you talk a little bit about what are the Baha'i grassroots efforts that help to combat racism on yeah. the ground. Yeah, I want to. I want to be careful about something. I don't. I don't mean to suggest that it is some. It, it's antithetical for a Baha'i to be engaged in civil disobedience. Um, if if what's going on in society it conflicts with the core teachings of the faith, like um, you know, uh, the oneness of mankind, then yeah, we have a responsibility to kind of lend our voices, right, um, to acknowledge uh, the injustice that is occurring. Um, so I'm just saying that when it, when it gets into, um, you know, if something deviates off into a space that is, you know, is about hurting someone else, that's when we kind of have to kind of check ourselves and think about that. Um, you know, the Baha'i faith, uh, the, 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 the kind of, uh, Baha'is all over the world are engaged in this process called the core activities, which is about community building, right? Um, it's uh, this engagement with your community, the neighborhood that you live in, to um, just help to kind of, uh, extend this uh, circle of community and to build sincere relationships um, 
you know, uh, across cultures, across uh, demographics, uh, within your, your, your community, in essence, to help to spiritualize the entire planet. And those are do things like children's classes where, um, you know, um, uh, children are uh, in the neighborhood, in the community, are introduced to uh, the spiritual virtues of God. Again, those are things like justice, um, you know, courage, uh, peace, love, so forth and so on. Um, we have devotional gatherings, which is something that I'm engaged in personally, which is uh, just bringing community members together to say prayers and read holy writings and just to spend time together in fellowship, you know. Um, junior youth empowerment workshops, which is about really um, encouraging young people to be engaged in um, doing acts of service in their community um, and to think about themselves as, um, as these spiritual beings, these incredible expressions of, uh, of, of God's unique creativity with these um, um, really remarkable um, souls. And, uh, and then also, uh, you know, a series of courses called Ruhi Books, which is where we kind of really delve into um, different aspects of the Baha'i faith and uh, look at some of the writings. And none of these things are engagements that are about um, proselytizing or getting anybody in the community to be a Baha'i. It is really a service that is offered to the community um, as a way to build um, and consolidate relationships. And, uh, and hopefully, if we've done our work with a purity of intent and, uh, you know, and we've been um, uh, kind, of, kind of faithful to the core values of our faith, that uh, we will uh, leave our neighborhoods when we do leave or if we stay there for the rest of our lives, but they will have been better because of our presence in those communities. So that's the goal, man. I mean, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a simple kind of, um, you know, thinking about the goal of it, it's simple and, uh, you know, but um, uh, fundamentally it's just about making our communities a better place. That's, that's all it has to do. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, let's hit some more of these questions here. Sure. Um, Carl Hindi says, in terms of your Baha'i principles and anti-racism, can you tell of concrete examples in daily life which you felt you handled well versus not so well? Times you went home and thought about how you wish you had handled it differently. Help going from a general way of being to situations in our daily life where yeah. we can act differently. Um, go ahead, yeah, go please ahead. go. Please. No, no, no. no please. I, I got say, one. I, but I can I can tell you two specific examples. Uh, when I was a kid, man, I was growing up in, uh, I, I was living in Miami, Florida for a while. And um, that was my, my, one of my first visceral encounters with, uh, with racism. I had kids that used to call me, um, they called me uh, the N word so much, I thought it was my middle name. And used to tease me about the, 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 the curl of my hair, the size of my lips. And I used to fight, man. I mean, I, I used to, I must have, almost every other day, it, it felt like I had a fight on a school playground. Um, so. That's the way that was just as a kid, that was my instinct. <laughs> you know, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, I happened to be at, and this to show you another way of dealing with it as I got a little bit older and understand some things in a different way. I happened to be in an event where um, I was doing a presentation and uh, it was about uh, uh, this project uh, that uh, kind of centered on the slave market that used to exist at Five Points Martyr Station here in Atlanta. Uh, in the audience, there happened to be an older white gentleman who was a, um, a, a well-respected attorney, um, well-known attorney. And at the end of the presentation, he came up and he said, I don't know why you're talking about this stuff. Why are you bringing this stuff up? I mean, I'm offended that you would bring the, these things up, the, the, the history of slavery in Atlanta. So after I um, kind of took in what he was saying, um, we, I, 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 we began a dialogue and I could tell within a few minutes of speaking with him that uh, although I, I uh, if a legal matter came up, I would defer to his experience and his knowledge because I uh, well understand what I don't, what, what is not my lane. But when it came to matters of race and the history of racism, um, I felt like uh, he needed to do some work. So um, we had a conversation uh, right there. I said, you know what, I suggested some books for him to read. And then I said, you know what, man, you, you, I think we've got an opportunity here. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I think God is presenting us with an opportunity to have a deepened conversation about some of the things that you're bringing up. So I said, I'm gonna give you my number and let's have a conversation. Mm, wow, so talk about uncomfortable. Wife, yeah. yeah. So his wife was standing there and she, a poor woman, I, I had a sense that she probably had been having some of these same discussions with him, but for whatever reason, he wasn't listening to her. <laughs> so, 
so I, I waited. He didn't call. Um, and so I decided to call him. And I left a message. And he didn't call back. I called again, left another message. He didn't call back. Uh, the third time, he answered the phone. I don't know if he looked at the call. He just did it instinctively. And I said, hey, Mr. So-and-so. Who's this? Masood. Phone went quiet for a minute. Oh. <laughs> and we began a 45-minute dialogue about the, the issue of race, uh, the history of slavery in Atlanta. And I, at the end of the conversation, which I thought, um, although it was, um, it was difficult at some points, I thought uh, it, it really laid the groundwork for potentially a more deepened, uh, growing uh, relationship if we both had the courage to uh, make the choice um, to build that. Um, but he never contacted uh, me again after that. And, um, but, but it was, and that was okay. I mean, it was, it was, it was okay. I felt like he missed an opportunity. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was a different way uh, than Masood at uh, 47 or 48 when that happened was very different than Masood at uh, 10 or 11 years old on the playground. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so those are, you know, th those are an example of, of uh, two different ways that, that I have uh, handled it in my life. And I think <laughs> some, well some growth, really. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting because part of my learning process recently has been, hey, we're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Um, we all are, especially white people who are going to try and do more of the right thing. And we're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to say it in the wrong way. We're going to, feelings will be hurt. It will be awkward. It will be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. And we have to just keep going. Exactly. Um, and it was interesting because I uh, did a presentation uh, I was part of a presentation on some race issues in the last month or two and I led with talking about my privilege and you know what I'd learned about privilege and yeah. um, what pri white privilege meant to me and you know being male and middle-aged and being a tv celebrity and all this kind of privilege and and this uh, uh, a, a Baha'i uh, mm -hmm from nearby where I live, uh, mm -hmm. called me uh, and was very offended and was very upset with me and wanted to speak to me about it. And I was very open about it and had a discussion. And this person thought that the way that I did it, that I was trumpeting my privilege mm -hmm. and that I was, uh, my intention was to probably joke about it a little too much as I want to do, but yeah. my intention was to lead with it because mm -hmm. people of color, friends that I'd had, had always mentioned that they really appreciate it when white people are able to kind of talk about their de facto privilege that the color of their skin gains them. But this yeah. person thought that the way that I did it was, had some arrogance in it. Um, and so it kind of had me, you know, had me stop and think. And I thanked them for the conversation. I was like, you know, let me run this by some people. Let me process this, pray about it, meditate about it. and. You know, I, I realized that it's, this stuff is so delicate. Yeah. My, my intention was to do the right thing and lead with the right way, but this person perceived it a certain way. And so I had to kind of think mm -hmm. about that and to, you know, again, make sure that part of my white privilege is, um, you know, as Shulgi Effendi, uh, a, a great leader in the Baha'i faith, uh, said that, you know, white people can have an, um, a sense of superiority that comes out. And so I have to be constantly checking. Sorry, mm -hmm. this sun is crazy in my eyes here. Um, so that was, you know, um, something that I needed to look at. So it was an interesting yeah. learning, learning and growth experience. You know, man, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because I think uh, two qualities that, you know, that are essential to doing this work and the eradication of racism is patience and uh, perseverance, you know? Um, and, you know, the patience, I think about patience, I'm like, well, what is, when we're talking about patience, you know, I mean, black folks have been patients for 401 years, <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, I mean, and I, and I think about that, I'm like, well, how does that manifest in relationships? And I think what I have understood for myself is that, you know, I'm, I, I accept the fact that 
you're going to make mistakes, that I'm going to make mistakes. Um, and that for me is not a deal breaker. What's important to me is that you show up and you're present. And I'm going to show up and be present. And if we show up and we're present spiritually, mentally, intellectually, enough, right? We'll do our work. You know? So that, that for me is, is, is really what's important. I just need to know that you, um, you and I talked about this, man. My best friend is a cat from Scotland, man. I mean, we've been hanging and banging for 30 years, dude. I mean, he's a real Scot. And we've had some interesting conversations, man, around the issue of race. And sometimes he said some things that, you know, I, you know, I, I, I had, we had to talk about. But I have never once in our relationship felt like this brother um, did not have my best interest in heart. Had, I always knew he had my best interest at heart. And I always mm -hmm. knew that he would show up with his authentic self. And that for me is, it, it seems to me, we get back to that truthfulness being the foundation of all human virtues. Mm -hmm. Show up with your authentic self. Let's join hands. Let's do this work. Mm -hmm. So one question, you know, obviously, sorry for jumping in here, but no, so, so much personal work, you know, obviously that we all have to do. We got to change hearts, including our, we're starting with our own and society at the same time. How do you guys not get defensive when people come at you. Mm. Yeah. Because I feel like that that's such a fundamental thing mm -hmm. that we're gonna have to figure out mm -hmm. um, if we're really if we're gonna have these conversations, you know, with people who come in who don't have necessarily our best interest at heart or who yeah. are really challenging us in a way that we feel, you mm -hmm. know, not just uncomfortable, but potentially like attacked or, you know, really like you know, that, that fight or flight mm -hmm. kicks in. So yeah. what have you all learned to really, to, if fight or flight might kick in, but how do you override that? Yeah. You want to take I, that first? Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have an answer uh, yeah. to that, but I will say that um, I've been reading this book that is on the bestseller list and has been for a long time called White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And it's all about like, why are white people so get so defensive and prickly about issues and matters of race. And um, just in reading the book, like I've just, it's allowed me to breathe and just yeah. relax into this a little bit more. Just like, yeah, why are we so prickly and defensive? And why is that? Um, and how, how do we get out of that? And, 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 and let it go. And it's kind of like Masood was saying earlier about truthfulness and that this kind of lie that America has been built on, it's getting out of the denial um, of the issues of systemic racism and um, allowed me to see it more clearly. And it's, it's just it's simply reading the book has allowed my, cause she says some pretty, she says some stuff there that really like, you know, gets at some, gets at us white people in some, in some ways. And it's, and then it's, um, uh, it's just helped me breathe into the issue better. That's just one little helpful tool. Masood? I mean, it, you know, every situation is different, right? I mean, uh, it depends on what a person says and how they say it. Uh, I'm very, I'm often very interested in why a person said what they said. So I, I quite oftentimes ask questions. You know, I'm really interested in what motivated you to say that. What were you thinking? Hmm. So, I'm all that, that I found that um, uh, more times uh, than not leads to some interesting conversations, right? Mm -hmm. um, because the person may have said something that they're not even, that's just the way that they've operated for so many years and they haven't even taken the time to really think about what it is to what they said and what that implies and how that might be tethered, tethered to a whole history and how mm -hmm. that might land for someone who is, you know, in that group. You know, so um, I found for me, that's been incredibly help helpful. Uh, you know, if someone is, uh, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I don't, uh, you know, I'm more of a peaceful brother now. So, <laughs> so I haven't had a fight in a long time. I don't want to have a fight. And, you know, that, that kind of those days are behind me. 
but if someone is really like out on you know in, in left field somewhere i i really don't even um you know abdul baha uh you know uh used to say uh he somebody would try and argue with him he would say at, at the, he would say something like um you know you try your way i'll try mine <laughs> you know, so and i think with some folks you just gotta you know okay i'm gonna you know say a prayer for him you know inwardly you know that uh a sincere prayer, not one that's like, you know, um, spiteful or um, vindictive, because though prayer can be used as a weapon as well, you know, um, but a sincere prayer from your heart that, you know, you really hope that uh, somewhere down the road that they will uh, uh, wake up and, and, and become more conscious of, um, of their sickness, of their illness. And uh, we are talking about an illness. I think it's important to to really talk about racism as a disease, a spiritual illness. Um, that is, uh, it, it's a malignancy and you can pass it on to your children. Um, you can pass it on to your friends. Um, but like any other illness, um, you know, um, they're secure. And, uh, you know, as Baha'is in this day, you know, we believe in the message of Baha'u'llah and this principle of the oneness of mankind with all humility, but also with uh, a firmness and the inner conviction, I firmly believe that Baha'u'llah's revelation is the cure. So, um, yeah, that's, I don't know, that's the best and I, I, I I echo that, um, Masood, and uh, this might be a good, there's a lot more questions here, and apologies to everyone whose question we didn't get to. Um, but uh, I agree with you that Baha'u'llah's spiritual remedy as a divine physician for this day and age is just the cure the healing waters that humanity needs i know this in my heart yeah. i see it in action um i see it in uh what happens at green acre what happens with you masood and um so jessica i just want to say to the the people and i, I hope Hope that you'll fill them in like if people want to learn more both about the Baha'i faith if they want to engage more in meaning deep and meaningful conversations about of all kinds of spiritual issues uh, if they want to participate in a devotional gathering if they want to help serve in their community if they want to be part of this community building grassroots process it's really exciting what the six million Baha'is around the world are engaged in, in, in any country that you can possibly name um, is can you can you help direct the folks uh, where they might go yeah. through the power of the internet? Absolutely, <laughs> you all can go to Baha'i.org. You actually all receive an e like an automated Zoom email to Mark with info with information in there if you want to learn more. Um, you can also check out what Greenacre is up to at Greenacre.news. We've got some events up there. Um, I'm sure you can. Uh, Google Masood and Rain and find out what they're up to as well. I don't know if there's anything that you would like to. You don't want to do that. You really <laughs> don't. You don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Don't, don't go there. <laughs> you can also, folks, if you want to like talk to any Baha'is in your own area, you can call 1-800-22-UNITE and they'll actually get you in touch with Baha'is in your own area. Um, I think that this one, one line that really stood out to me was, and I don't know if this is exactly what you said, my student, but basically discomfort is the tax we pay for progress. Yeah. For oneness. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so then how do we get ourselves? How do we push ourselves through that discomfort? How do we choose discomfort? That's the thing that I'm now going to be chewing on. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, who, who in the heck runs towards, you know, un until you realize the, the, the real benefits that come from it. And you, I mean, you have to force yourself to run towards pain. Right. And let's not, let, let's not, let's be honest. This is, this, this process of healing from the sickness of, of racism involves mm -hmm. pain and discomfort. It does. But, um, you know, Bahola uh, talks about this uh, metaphor of a woman giving birth, right? and a baby growing in the womb is gestation period and then you get to labor and the pains that the uh that the mother feels 
as she's going into labor are, are so excruciatingly unbearable for some, right? But then the baby's born. And then all of that pain, she wouldn't trade that pain mm -hmm. for that child, mm -hmm. you know? So she is grateful having gone through the pain if the child, this healthy, beautiful child is the result. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we're about the business of creating a new world and we're sincere and, um, you know, we desire with all of our hearts, um, community, um, oneness, a world without racism, a world without sexism, um, then we will be willing to do the work that that requires. And, um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Seeing the end in the beginning. Absolutely. And the vision. You know, Tony Robbins says the vision is the one thing that'll get you through the day. You can yeah. get the difficulty of the day if you know where you're going and you believe that in your heart, like you were saying, not just your head. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That's, that's great. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so, so very much for being here and taking uh, this time out of your busy schedule. Rain just moved today. I know. Like moving his Rain house. Rain has been moving. Rain has been moving. <laughs> <laughs> that's my room. That's my new op my office with a bunch of pictures on the floor. Yeah. Crazy. You're showing up. You're showing up, even though you moved um, on. I love these conversations. I love having deep, meaningful conversations on spiritual themes. It's my favorite thing in the world. And uh, I would drop anything to be a part of them. So thank you, Jessica, for putting this together and Greenacre and the whole team over there. And thank you, Masood, so much. I uh, got so much out of uh, hearing you today and interacting oh, with you today. Brother, thank you. You know, this is our second conversation, Rain. And I, I you know, I'm, I just appreciate you brother i want to lift you up in the work you do man the intentionality with which you do the work you do man and uh you you show up and you do your work brother i love you for that i respect you for that and um you know i'm just uh happy to uh to sit and chat for a while man this has been awesome and there's nothing you know as much as i love being an artist and god knows i love being an artist and a creative person it is not the most important subject in my life to talk about mm -hmm. Baha'u'llah's revelation is, is the most important of the important things in my life to talk about. So I'm just so happy to be here and be able to do that. So thank you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank you. thank you. And our honor. All right, everybody at home. Thanks for much. So, thanks so much for sticking this out with us and, and staying with us. And we hope you have a great night. And please come back again. This, will, this, this is being recorded and it will be up on our website, greenacre.news in a week or so. So if you want to share it with your friends, do so. Do you have an upcoming discussion in at, as Greenacre hosting another one of these soon? Um, you know, we had one last night that was amazing. Dr. Mapayan, <laughs> Laylee Mapayan, she did Womanism and African Worldview and knocked it out. It was, so that uh, actually recording will be up on our website soon. She's um, amazing. Amazing. She is, um, oh my God. Yeah, she's, she's incredible. Amazing. I'm actually just looking yeah. at her website right now because my brain yeah. is blank. Um, yeah, we've got some other things coming up. We actually have an art show that we're in the midst of getting up and going. It'll all be digital. It's called, it's, it's Pupil of the Eye. It's art, which is a, a term that Baha'u'llah used to talk about people of African descent, that they're like the pupil of the eye through, yeah. which is the fount of light. The light of the spirit shines through their eyes. So there's Absolutely. something unique and special in particular yeah. about people of African descent that we have yeah. to recognize. And so we have a whole art show um, exploring that. And Dr. Mapayan's um, talk last night was actually leading up, a dialogue space leading up to that art show. Oh, that's so, awesome. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so those, those pieces will be up Wonderful. soon. In a week or so and uh, we actually have devotions every morning if people want to join us we all get together like you, anybody can join us and we have devotions every monday through friday you can check that out also on our website what time you know, gonna, what's that what time oh yeah good question uh <laughs> 9 a.m eastern time a little early for y'all on the west coast <laughs> Nine, eight, 6 a.m okay i'm, I'm there <laughs> I would still be sleeping if I were you. If he shows up at 6 a.m. his time, let me know, Jessica. I want confirmation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. That would be awesome. awesome. We would love that. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, y'all. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Good Have night. Have a great night. Bye.